everyone, and welcome to uh, this evening's Ed Sign. Um, we're delighted that you're here, and also hello to everyone on the live stream uh, going out. Uh, if anyone has any questions on uh, the live stream, please feel free to tweet them in or uh, put them on Facebook, and we'll uh, try to include them at the end. I am today delighted to introduce Michael Richardson. Um, Michael is currently a PhD student at um, the University, at Harriet Watt University, looking at um, deaf people's engagement with theatre. Um, he has a background as a theatre practitioner uh, as well, um, and he's written a book called uh, Youth Theatre Drama for Life, uh, which is very well received, as I understand it, but I'm sure he'll tell you more about his background in this very interesting presentation, uh, The Sign Language Interpreted Performance, an Instance of Intercultural Miscommunication. Hi, my name is Michael. Michael. Hi, my name is Andy. Andy. Hi, my name is Marion. Marion. So, I'm mostly going to speak this evening, um, but I wanted to introduce the interpreters because as well as interpreting in a normal way, we're actually going to work together to show you some of the things that I want to explain to you so you get a, a more clear understanding by just seeing it happen in the space. So I'm going to be talking about sign language interpreted performances, which I'll explain later, but just to explain a couple of things on the slide, I think because you're here you're guessing that intercultural means the crossover between deaf and hearing cultures, but also by miscommunication, I mean any instance in which communication fails. So not just when there's no communication, but also at the other extreme, where people try really hard to communicate, but it still doesn't quite work. So these are the things I'm going to talk about, a little bit about my own background, some context and definitions, and particularly a definition that comes from performance studies about what makes a performance. Then I'm going to go on and talk about sign language interpretive performances and my own research. And if there's time at the end, although I'm anticipating going off script once or twice, but if there is time at the end, a little bit about what I'd like to do in the future. So my background, um, I've worked in theatre for quite a long time. That's me on your right with Lawrence Olivier. Um, I actually worked as a director. Um, and I'm now, I guess, what you call a practitioner researcher, which means I've done some work in the real world, and now I'm doing some research about the kind of work that I was doing in the real world. So I'm combining now practical skills, professional skills, with research skills. I'm hearing, obviously, but I'm from a hearing family. I grew up in Rochdale, where there was a really strong deaf community, but it's only looking back now that I recognise that the place I grew up did not engage with that community at all, and it was very, very separate. And there was a deaf family across the road from where I grew up, and we had no connection with that family at all. But it's only in retrospect that I realised that that separation was a thing that was going on. As Ellis said, I've done a lot of work in theatre and youth theatre, and maybe 10 years ago, I was working in West Lothian, and Donaldson's moved from Haymarket to West Lothian, and suddenly, I started to meet deaf young people. They would start to come in to where I was working. And this kind of triggered two strands of development in my professional life. The first was I started to learn BSL. Um, I went up to level three. I became a communication support worker briefly at Edinburgh College. Um, and now I'm still involved in the deaf community on a language basis, um, teaching literacy to deaf adults for the city council. And in theatrical terms, it triggered for me a kind of exploration of how sign language and how deaf people can participate in a theatre and looking for ways to engage deaf audiences so they have the same experience that the hearing people in the same audience have. So I started off by putting an interpreter on stage, which was all very odd, because he was a big guy wearing all black, surrounded by eight-year-old munchkins in really bright coloured things in the, in the Wizard of Oz. Um, and I worked, the last, the last big show I did um, was a musical in which every character was played by two people, one singing and one signing, and the chorus, instead of choreography, used sign language to put the language across, both through, through song and through sign language. 
After doing that, I realised I was focusing on language, but I wasn't actually putting anything into the shows that might engage deaf people on any other level. And that's why I decided to uh, do a PhD, so I could start to look at how cultures could overlap, as well as languages, um, and start to look at accessibility more widely, uh, which brought me into this research into sign language interpretive performances. So some very definitions. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole of things you understand where I'm coming from. By deaf, I mean a group, a community in which storytelling and why that's important is because when storytelling becomes more full is to um, sign language and have the which is in sign language about the deaf experience and about transmitting deaf culture. And in opposition to that, and I know that's really superficial to say there's only deaf and hearing, but in opposition to that, by hearing, I mean people who speak, in this context, people who are using English, and people who, and, and, a, and a community within which the written word is really important. So within hearing culture, plays are based predominantly on written scripts, as opposed to deriving from stories about everyday experience. So, okay, that's that. I just need also briefly to tell you uh, about a theoretical framework that I've used that comes from performance studies. And I've chosen to use performance studies rather than theatre studies for theory because it applies equally well to theatre and to interpreter-mediated communication. And um, I'm going to use the theories of a German woman called Fischer Lichter. Thank you. I won't say that again. Um, and she talks about performance and the things that, uh, the building blocks that create a performance. And I'm going to use what we're doing to demonstrate that because this is a performance. I'm performing now, we're performing now to you and you are our audience. So the first building block that she talks about is the body. And by looking at a body, you can, you as the audience, understand a certain amount of things. So if you look at this picture, all of you are having some kind of reaction to that. Some people think it's funny, somebody near the front thinks it's horrible, um, and you're all developing your own stories about what that means. That's just one man who's a bodybuilder. But by looking at somebody's bodies, you also, you, you start to learn something. So if I show you this picture, slightly different, also a bodybuilder, but it's not really what you want to see in a world leader. And as performers, we can manipulate that. So if I show you this picture, that's odd. And if this was a physics uh, lecture, you'd be quite confused now about what I was trying to say about Einstein. So I'm going to leave, I know that's a bit distracting, but I'm going to leave that picture there just for now. Um, and I'm going to ask Marion to come and join us, because now I'm going to explain the same thing, but I'm going to use our bodies. So at the moment, I'm the actor, and Andy is interpreting me. And now we've deliberately dressed the same, and we've deliberately started with Andy as my interpreter, so that he gives a really accurate reflection, representation of me as the actor. Not only are we wearing similar clothes, we have the same haircut, we have the same boyish good looks, we're roughly the same age in my dreams. Um, so there's this whole idea that Andy represents me quite easily, and that's very obvious for you. But if we look at Marion, and Marion was to interpret for me, that's suddenly a bit odd. Now I'm being represented by a woman in a dress and heels. So now Marion's playing the character of Michael, but like this picture, that's a bit confusing because I'm not wearing a dress and I don't look like that. Now in this context, you're thinking about what we're talking about and you're really focusing on that. But there's some really well-established science that tells us the first thing that happens in your brain when you see us is an instinctive emotional reaction to what you see before your brain starts to think about what we're talking about. So actually the first thing that happened in your brain when Marion started performing Michael was, my God, Michael looks good in a dress. 
<laughs> so, that's the body stuff. It's a little bit confusing, but just hold those thoughts. Um, because I'm going to come back to that when I get to talking about sign language interpretive performances. And now I'm going to talk about the second building block, which is the use of space. So this, relate, this is on two levels. The first is about the architectural space, the building that you find yourself in. Sorry, Marion, but I still need you just for a second. <laughs> um, as you came into this building, it's very obviously a university building. You walk into here, it's a lecture theatre. It's pretty clear that you're coming to something that's at least a little bit academic. If you walk into that building, which is an opera house, then it's also pretty clear that you're going into some kind of theatre experience. So the, the larger building that you walk into gives you an impression of the kind of event you're attending. So that's on a bigger level as an issue of space, but then also there's a, an issue of performance space, the space that I'm occupying, and how I or we use that. So if you just focus on me for a second, just think about me for a second. If I stand here, that's using the space in one way, which is very open and accessible to everybody. Equally, I could stand here, and that gives a whole different feel. I feel like I'm much more authoritative, a bit distant from you. So I can manipulate the way I use the space. At the same time, we can manipulate the way we use the space. So now Andy's interpreting for me. If you just come over here a little bit, Andy. So. Who's in Marion? You go for it. Yep. So if I have Andy next to me and he's my interpreter, then we're in the same space. But if Marion's interpreting like this, then that she's really put in a separate space from where I am, and that creates some issues about where you're looking. This is me, but when Marion interprets, harder when I start to see and you're having to look in, in different spaces. So space is, is clearly an issue for uh, building a performance. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> so the third thing, the third building block that's talked about in this theory of performance is the use of sound. And what she, what this woman, I won't say her name again, uh, what she means is mostly about language. She's also talking about sound effects and music, but mostly what she's talking about language. And I'm, I'm going to take that out because I'm interested in the possibilities of spoken language and sign language. And it doesn't really make any sense for me to just put language in the, the, the building block of the use of sound. So remember sound, that's one thing. But also I'm considering it as a separate building block, that was sound. Um, the use of language, because it may be physical on the body or it may be part of sound. And again, you can play with language. At the moment, I'm speaking and deciding. But maybe if I start signing, and you can start voicing over for me. Or. <laughs> so we can use language in lots of different ways. Um, and it doesn't have to be just sound, and it's another way of creating a performance. So, what we're doing in creating a performance then is using language, we're using space, we're using our bodies, and we're using sound to communicate with you as our audience, to give you information. And what you are doing, and there's a lot of research that backs this up, is that first of all, you're having this instinctive emotional reaction to what you see, and then, a little bit slower, I mean we're still talking a tiny part of a second, but a little bit slower, you start to think, focus thinking about what's going on. And during the performance, what you're thinking about is following what's happening, like on a superficial level. And then after the performance, either by yourself or by talking to other people, or hopefully tonight by asking questions, you start to think more deeply about the meaning of what you've seen and the intention is that that has some kind of effect on you. In theatre, the, the hope is that it gives you some kind of transformational effect that you go out and change your life or improve society, um, this kind of stuff. And if we fail to have that effect on you, then that's our responsibility of not communicating well enough to you 
what we want you to understand. So that's performance theory and a bit of audience theory. My research been into sign language interpreted performances. I want to know what they are and I want to know if they work and how they work <coughs> or not. Most importantly, I want to know, wanted to know if they communicate well with deaf people. So sign language interpreted performances look like this. Okay, can you see the interpreter? This tiny black dot in the bottom corner. We'll do it. So if I'm the actor, then the interpreter is all the way over there, like Marion before. This is a typical model for a sign language interpreted performance in Britain, that the, the interpreter is some distance away. So I'm going to talk about it. You can come back. I think it's better helpful. Um, I'm going to talk about them in terms of those building blocks that I mentioned before. So typically, in terms of the use of language, the performance by the actors is in English and it's translated into sign language, not the other way. And I, just to be clear, I'm not talking about captions tonight at all, although I showed you one. It, this is just about signed and spoken language. So typically they're spoken language into sign language. In terms of space, they almost always take place in a mainstream public theatre building. This kind of theatre, all the big Victorian theatres in Edinburgh, those kinds of theatres where they typically take place. They are much less often happening in community theatres and those kinds of spaces. Um, and as this picture shows, the play happens in the main space, which in, on that picture is through the archway, and the interpreter is in a separate performance space outside the archway. Um, in terms of using the body, there's usually one interpreter, but there may be lots of people on stage. So there's a real... We, I showed you the mismatch between me and Marion before. Imagine Andy's trying to interpret for seven people, four women, three men, one old, one of, the, one of the women is only seven, and he's having to represent all of those with that body. No words required. Um, so, and finally, in terms of sound, um, there's obviously the speech that's coming from the stage, but a theatre play uses a lot of other sound to communicate with the audience and there's the problem then of translating sound effects and music into a sign language interpretation and making that work for the deaf audience. So I'm saying all of this before I tell you what my research was. So I think it's clear that I wasn't expecting very positive results. Um, but I'm hearing, so I can't know that deaf people don't like sign language interpretive performances. And that's why I, I did this research, to, to find out if sign language interpreted performances are communicating effectively and accurately to deaf people. And I was very fortunate that at the time that I wanted to do it, a theatre in Edinburgh was also looking for that research to be done because they, they're concerned that the number of deaf audience members are, are much lower than they expected. And in fact, that is a picture that appears across the UK that fewer deaf people go than you might expect. So what did I do? Um, I, that's, a, that's a focus group. I don't know why people in focus group have no faces. but <laughs> um, So what I did was I identified one sign language interpretive performance. It was at a city centre theatre that hosts touring theatre. So I'm talking about a theatre that doesn't have its own actors and director and theatre company. It buys in companies from somewhere else to bring a show that they've created, typically in London. But they use a local interpreter um, who, who they already know. And the most important thing is that I took a group of deaf people to see it, and then I asked them what they thought. Now that might seem really obvious, but it turns out that in theatre studies, almost nobody talks to audiences. Lots of people talk about <coughs> audiences and how audiences are supposed to react or might react, but there's only significantly one academic who's done some serious research by actually talking to audiences, taking them out for dinner, that kind of stuff after the show. That's where I'm heading. <laughs> um, it's also the same in interpreting studies for slightly different reasons. A lot of, um, a lot of interpreter mediated interactions are in quite sensitive environments, medical things, police or court related. So obviously you can't wade in as an academic and ask the people who've been interpreted for. So a lot of interpreting studies focus on interpreters, and that's also true in theatre. The few studies that have been done 
about theatrical interpreting have, have been by, with, on interpreters. So I took a group of deaf people and, and then after the show we sat around and we had quite a long conversation, not just about the show we'd seen, but a, we used that as a trigger to talking about going to theatre generally and what that, what that experience was. So the, the, the results don't relate to the one show that we went to see, but they're much broader than that. I also spoke to a group of hearing people that went to see the same show so I can make some comparisons and see what hearing people had to say about some of the issues. Um, and I interviewed the interpreter and I interviewed the two staff at the theatre that are responsible for setting up sign language interpretive performances. To be clear about two things that I didn't do, I didn't have access to the theatre company, so I couldn't talk to any of the actors or the stage manager or any of these people, and I didn't um, have any bilingual people in the study, so none of what was discussed was specifically about the translation that we saw on the day. Nobody there had the skills to, to comment on that, so that, that won't be included in this. So, results. Um, they're kind of split into two bits. Sorry. So the results are split into two parts. I was really expecting lots of stuff about what happened on stage, which I got. Um, but I also got a lot of stuff about what happens front of house in a sort of box office foyer bar areas. And I'll come back, come back to that in a little while. But to go to the headline <laughs> results straight away, I think this is the only quote I'm going to give you, but I feel I picked up half the performance and half the interpreter. I had to take that and create something myself. It's not good. It wasn't clear. That's a really perfect example of the kind of feedback I was getting from the deaf audience that it's really difficult to follow a sign language interpreted performance and building meaning from what you see is very much your own responsibility because you can't rely on um, the totality of what you're looking at to do that for you. So let's go back again to the building blocks um, of theatre. Einstein's back. Um, <coughs> so a um, the deaf group identified problems with all four of those building blocks of theatre. Firstly, language. First problem, lots of the shows that are chosen to be interpreted just have too much language. They are too wordy. What works for deaf people is something that's very visual, very physical. But the policy in this theatre, as in most theatres actually, or it publicly funded mainstream theatres, is to interpret everything without considering whether it actually will be that accessible for deaf people. So a lot of the shows are too wordy. Secondly, it's always from English into sign language. There's never deaf theatre performed in sign language. Um, and that means that also there's, there's never the, um, the representation of deaf culture and the experience of deaf people on mainstream stages. And the third thing, language-wise, is that, and this comes from the literature, not from my research, but actually translating a play is really, really hard. It's complex language. There's no redundant language. Every single word is really important, but there's lots of double meaning and deep layers uh, underneath it. And that's just talking about translating within spoken languages. Then you also get things like wordplay and um, poetry that work differently in sign language. So translating those is an almost impossible task. And then on top of that, and I'll come back to this in a little while, preparation time that interpreters have very, very limited. So you have all those problems and then make it even harder to create them being interpreted in time to do the job. We really use a space. Um, we saw this before. So the interpreter um, is in a different space and my deaf group were basically stating the obvious, how can you watch that in front of you and watch that at the same time. It's just not physically possible. And the, the idea they put across was, if at least the interpreter can move into the space, not in the middle and taking over,
but just a little bit into the space, then it would be possible to watch both just by swiveling eyeballs. And that's so much easier than having to turn your head because you're still peripherally aware of the other thing. So this was a, this was a real problem. Um, then other things about the, the space occupied by the interpreter was typically not well lit. And then there's another thing about that, which is if the light levels are constantly changing on stage, it feels like the light levels are constantly changing on the interpreter, even if that's not the case. So you're constantly having to readjust to different light levels. And then also, if the interpreter's off to the side, there are only some seats in the auditorium that are useful for, for watching both the interpreter and the stage. So, of course, they may not be available, but also what typically happens is that everybody thinks the interpreter is going to be on one side, and then when you get in the auditorium, they're on the other side, and so you've put seats in completely the wrong place. Um, there's one other thing about, about the use of space which really annoys me, um, and that is that actors and some audience members, but not all, some hearing audience members, say that it's very distracting to have the interpreter over there. Well, of course it is. It's like a TV in a pub. You're trying to have a conversation with somebody there, and there's something on the TV over there. It's very, very distracting. But counterintuitively, and my hearing group said this, if you put the interpreter onto the stage, when you're watching what's on stage, you only take from that the information that you need to understand what's going on. And the example they gave was going to see a puppet show. You stop watching the puppeteers after about two minutes because they're not doing anything. You focus on the puppets because they're the, they're the things that are talking, talking to you. But the puppeteers, they're just like background uh, static. <coughs> so moving on quickly to the use of sound, just to say that the hearing group identified that there were quite a lot of significant moments in the show that we went to see when information was only given through sound effects or, as a particular example, a change in accent. So one character was a spy, he had a very upper class English accent until he was revealed as a spy and then he started speaking in a German accent. This is, this is not interpretable and it's not in the text. It just happened and it was completely missed by the deaf people in the audience. And there were, there were other things missed by the deaf audience members uh, similar to that. Finally, the use of the body. Um, we already talked about what happens if you don't match the interpreter to the actor. You could have Einstein looking like a bodybuilder or Michael in a dress. Um, typically what happens... Typically what happens in the theatres um, in Scotland is one of two things. Either they use the same interpreters every time, so the show can change, but it's the same two interpreters who interpret. So they, don't they may match what's going on on stage, but not necessarily. Or the theatres have a much bigger group of interpreters, but they don't choose from that group to match the show they just tell that group when there's work needing done and leave it to the interpreters to say, I'm available for that one. So there's no attempt to cast the interpreters in the same way that actors are cast. I just think the, the effort that theatre companies put in to get everything right on stage, but then the interpreter that, that's supposed to represent that just volunteers because they don't have anything else on that day. Um, talked about that already. Um, I thought the really interesting thing that deaf people said um, about the use of body by the interpreter was that the interpreters tend to use a slightly toned down version of BSL, like a small signing space, not really huge physical, physical approach to signing. And it goes back to that kind of conduit model that interpreters talk about, where there's language to be interpreted so I take the signs and I translate them into English and put them out, but I won't influence that language by adding anything of my own personality or my own thoughts about how it should be done. But what the deaf spectators are saying is, that's a performance. That's the performance I'm looking at. So if you do it like a conference, all in black, quite calm, that's not what's happening on stage and it just doesn't match. So you have to sort of step it up and really 
um, use a lot of acting skills when you're interpreting theatre. So what, what, my, what my group suggested was that a lot of those things could be improved by better training and preparation for and by interpreters. So what they mean by better preparation is not that they think the interpreters don't work hard, um, but there are serious issues with interpreters in terms of the amount of time they're given and the resources they're given. So typically they're given a script, rarely they're given a DVD. They get to see the show, but only four days before they have to actually perform it. And theatre companies won't give any other information. So if, if you ask theatre companies for director's notes, some ideas of what the characters are like, this is not available. So they're really just working with the script, which is only one layer of the performance. So there are a lot of issues around performance. And interpreters have said, uh, both to me and in other studies, they really want this stuff, but it's just not available. And the other thing they really pushed for, the, the deaf focus group, was better training for theatre interpreters. Um, the, what they actually said was theatre interpreting should be recognised as a separate professional specialty because it's not conference interpreting. What's coming to them to interpret is not a conference speech. It's something much more, and um, it's much more complex. But it's also not community interpreting because it's not two-way. They're, they're throwing something out to the audience, but the audience aren't saying, hang on, I missed that, do that again. So it's, it sits somewhere between the two and it needs other skills. And so what they're suggesting um, is recognition as a separate professional specialty with bespoke training that, that fits the, the needs of theatrical interpreting. Um, to move to off-stage communication, front of house issues. Um, thanks, David, for your photograph. Um, just very quickly through this, because some of it's really obvious. If I go to the theatre, I expect that I, in advance I can quite easily find out who's in the show, that I can book tickets in my own language, that if I want to know about the, the actors and the characters and the story, I can buy a programme which will be in English and not Mandarin, so that I can just read it and I've got all the information I need. Deaf people are asking for basically the same stuff. Not actors, but interpreters. They want to know who the interpreter is because maybe they, they particularly like an interpreter or maybe they don't like an interpreter style and that would influence whether they go. And obviously they want to know which of the two spaces the interpreter is going to be standing in. Are they going to be on the right or the left so they can put the right seats? Um, they want improvements in box office. Um, it would be good if visual information could be provided in box office. It would be better if someone in box office could sign. Um, also, and it wasn't just a deaf group who said this, the interpreter also said this, and the theatre staff, you can't always guarantee that box office know it's an interpreted performance. So there are serious communication issues within the hierarchies within the theatre. And even if they do know it's an interpreted performance, they don't necessarily know where the interpreter is going to be standing or who the interpreter is. And the other thing that would be ideal, and this is provided in Glasgow but not in any theatres here, is pre-show talks in BSL with the story, with information about the characters, character sign names, so that when the interpreting starts, you know who's being spoken about already. Um, as an aside, the deaf group all said, we want as much information as we can get in advance. And the hearing group said, we don't want any information. If we can't discover it from the stage, it's not worth knowing. So deaf people are already setting up in advance that it's going to fail. <coughs> they, they, they feel they need to be prepared in advance, otherwise um, it's not going to work for them. So to summarise, really what I've... Sorry. <coughs> Perfect. To summarise, really what I found was this chain of miscommunication at all levels in the process. And um, it's not that people don't want sign language interpretive performances to work. Almost everybody in that chain is really committed to making them work. But there are failures of communication of different kinds that stop that happening. Now, I said almost everybody wants them to work. Visiting theatre companies are not keen. 
And when I say not keen, I mean actually really quite aggressively opposed to some of them. Some, some are happy for it to, to, to work, um, but the deal is that they pay half and the theatre that I did the research in pays half, but a lot of them don't give any money to support it. And quite often the actors are really aggressive, and I was told a couple of stories of verbal abuse from actors to interpreters just before the start of the show or in the interview. So, so at that end of the chain, that's a bit iffy. There's some dodgy stuff going on with the theatre companies. But as we then look at every other stage, the commitment to making them work is really strong. But there are issues. So the people in the theatre who are responsible for setting up these kinds of performances are responsible for customer services. This includes everything from selling pencils and balloons to actually liaising with... So, so it's a really small part of their work. Um, and it's easy to get sidelined from it. Also, those people have no influence over other departments. They have no authority over other departments. So they can say to box office all they like, please provide a visual representation of what's going on. But they can't actually force that issue. Um, a, re a really good example, at the risk of running over time, um, there's a, requ a request from some deaf audience members through my research to the theatre that signs are put on the doors into the auditorium that with a picture of where the interpreter is going to be standing. So that before you and bear in mind signs like doors because they have to. And so the access people said, great, that's a fantastic idea. And the theatre manager said you can't do that, this is a listed building. And they have no authority to overrule that. So that's kind of classic in, within the theatre, problems with communication. Um, also, theatre staff don't understand the role of the interpreter. They don't know how that job functions. And they're not bilingual, so they also can't evaluate it. They can't sit in the, in the theatre and go, fantastic interpreting, or not fantastic. Um, theatre staff also don't have the, the language skills to communicate with deaf audience members, so there's a natural problem there. Um, and then heading down the chain further, um, interpreters don't have the training. I talked about that already. So there are some issues they have uh, with creative translation. Then all those things we talked about already. Also, at the, at the audience end, it's very, it's very easy for deaf people, not all deaf people, and obviously those people who contributed to my study, thanks to them, um, don't fit into this character, but it's very easy to go, oh, one more disappointment in the hearing world. I'll just not go again, rather than start a meaningful conversation about how it could be improved. And that's understandable. But it also is another area in that, another link in that chain where more people could take responsibility for making improvements. So, nearly there. Um, you could say, so what? It's just theatre. It's hearing theatre, why would deaf people come anyway? It's probably not that interesting to them. <laughs> deaf people don't provide interpreters at deaf club in case two hearing people go along to see what's going on. So wh why bother? What's the point? This is the point. Theatre is supposed to represent the society that it sits in. But all theatres are run by the dominant section of that society because they have the money, they control the politics, and what results from that, often unavoidably, but absolutely results from it, is that theatre becomes a tool for oppression. If you sit in an office in a theatre and programme a, uh, a whole season of Shakespeare and other English language classics, and that's all you programme, all you do is promote hearing culture, and you ignore and therefore repress deaf culture by not, promote, by not programming deaf theatre, or Asian theatre, or all, all kinds of minorities, but just, let's just focus on the deaf people. So that's what happens, but if, if theatre is supposed to represent its own society, it has a responsibility to make sure those groups, like the deaf community, are welcomed in and supported in the same way. And I would say that now, especially since the BSL Act was passed, that Theatres should be working towards, because they are publicly funded, should be working towards creating the communication mechanisms 
that invite deaf people in and support them to be active citizens in the same way as other people that are coming into the theatre. Now, if that's going to be through sign language interpretive performances, fine. But if it is, a lot of people have got to get their act together because they really don't work. And there are lots of people saying, this is access, aren't we doing well? It's difficult, but it's still access. I'm here to tell you, it's not. Deaf people do not find those things accessible. And all the people in that gym need to start thinking about how they can improve their contribution to it and how they can rebuild those links so that they actually do start to work. Only then will deaf people be equal members of society in theatres. But think if that happens. Your average sign language interpreted performance in Edinburgh has more than a thousand hearing people at it. If those things work well, that's a fantastic way of profiling sign language, of putting deaf culture on display. And for me and the things I'm interested in, that's a really good stepping stone into actually getting deaf actors and deaf theatre onto mainstream stages. And that's proper validation of deaf culture. When that happens, I'll sit down. Fortunately, the theatre that staff that I worked with are very supportive of these ideas. I think it's clear from some of the things I've said that they've got a lot of challenges, not only of their own, but also with the people that they're working with. But they're really supportive. They've tried some things already in the past. Some of them learned BSL, it turned out. But because they don't market the shows well enough to deaf people and all the other stuff, hardly any deaf people were there, so nobody knew whether it was worth learning BSL. And then they all lost their skills. But they're really trying some of these things. Um, they've tr they, they try to respond to feedback. I think some people in the room have views on how effective that is, but they, do, they are trying actively to respond to feedback. And as part of the research, I supplied them with some recommendations, and they are exploring ideas around how they can improve front of house, and they're thinking very carefully, and, and me and a couple of other people are working with them, to think about how sign language interpretive performances can be set up better in Edinburgh. And that could be by importing a model from Glasgow Deaf Theatre Club, or it could be by working with a group of deaf people um, from the community in Edinburgh to talk about what deaf people really want and how that could work. Not sure which way that will go yet. If you're interested in the second, let me know. As for me, I'm looking to do something more like this. This was from, a, from the show. People sitting down are signing for the two characters standing up. I want to look at the next stage, the stage where deaf people are on stage um, and it's considered perfectly normal and, and everyday. <coughs> and of course that means working in sign language and English, but what I've come to realise is it also means thinking very carefully about two different cultures and how they are mixed on stage um, and how the experience of deaf people as well as the experience of hearing people is represented on stage. So what I'm going to do is sort of set up a creative space and set some goals for creating theatre that are about making sure it's accessible for deaf and hearing people in the audience at the same time. And then I'm going to stand back and watch the chaos and write about it and hand it in. And that will be my thesis. Um, in the first instance, it's just going to be a few workshop days because it's just a PhD um, and I need to raise a little bit of money. But ultimately, I hope that I can turn that into some kind of um, full production. And again, in both cases, the workshop days and fuller production, uh, the first thing I'll be doing after is asking people in the audience what they thought, what worked, what didn't. Because without the audience feedback, then um, how do you know? And in true Shakespearean uh, manner, I'm finished, and your audience feedback is to clap. <laughs> So any questions, I think. Well, it's, uh, I think possibly we should just take a short break, Good. give the interpreters a chance to uh, relax and to give everyone else the opportunity to uh, get a drink of water or to have so maybe five or ten minutes and then we will um, get questions and uh, if there are any questions from the internet, hello internet, 
then um, please do uh, tweet them in or put them on Facebook and we'll try to get them all covered. So five or ten minutes and then questions for Michael. Thank you. <coughs>
into room first while I can kind of marshal the online response. Uh, although um, we have had some feedback that the um, interpreter's uh, stripy shirt to match um, Andy's, no, to match Michael's stripy shirt uh, was very much appreciated and loving the look. Um, so any other questions, just tweet them in and I'll start trying to marshal them into a good order. And if you have any other questions from the floor, now's the time. Um, I'm not. Really not? No. <laughs> well, because um, so the, que the question was, um, I talked about putting on a whole show, and Marn is wondering how uh, how I will choose the show. And my my very quick answer is, I'm not going to choose a show. And and this is why and this is why I came back into academia to look into this. On, on some levels, this was great, but this was Sweeney Todd. It's a musical written by hearing people for hearing people. There are no deaf people in it. There's nothing about deaf people in it. So its relevance for deaf audiences is not there. And one of the things, one of the things that came out in the research was um, my hearing group, some of them were of a certain age, by which I mean even older than me, and they talked about going to see Jackie the Musical, which they loved because they were teenagers when Jackie was a magazine. And everything that happened in the show, they went, I remember that. Oh, I was just like that. And everybody, when they go to the theatre, likes that experience. And what my deaf group said was, when I come to this theatre, I don't expect anything to do with deaf people. And for me, that's not good enough. If you want deaf people to come in, you have to give them something that's got some relevance. So I wouldn't choose a show specifically like that because I think it's too prescriptively hearing I think it would be more useful I think two, two things are options I think it's useful to consider a deaf show but there aren't very many and some of them have been written a bit like hearing theatre um, or use a hearing show so one idea I've had I'm not sure if I'll go with this one idea I've had is to use some of the ideas from The Tempest. Because one of the things that happens in The Tempest is that this old guy called Prospero gets put in a boat and pushed out to sea and he lands on an island and the first thing he does is takes over the island and teaches everyone how to use his language. That's deaf experience. So I would be happy to take bits of ideas from shows but not to actually do The Tempest. And quite a few, there have been, there have been attempts by, not attempts, but I mean there have been groups of deaf people who've translated two or three Shakespeare shows maybe 30 years ago. Um, but there's a really strong argument, not within deaf studies, but within translation studies, that that's very much about the, the minority group, the colonialised group or whatever, trying to assimilate themselves with the majority group. And I think to go down that route risks criticism and risks getting into muddy waters unnecessarily. But if I get a group of 10 actors in the room and the deaf people say, let's do the Tempest, then that's their choice. And that's, that's the kind of approach I'm going to take. That it's about the group in the room, the actors in the room taking ownership and making decisions about what is communicated to the audience and how it's communicated to the audience. Any more? Do you want to speak into my little mic? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, I'm not sure this is a uh, comment so much as a question, but um, I'm speaking as a theatre interpreter now for quite a few years. And I am really encouraged by many of the things you're saying as a role. Yes, we should be reflecting what's up there. We should know that piece. We shouldn't be separate. But the thing that really struck me is that, I suppose, the gap that of stage crew and the stage manager. Because 
what I have found is our contact will be with the person in the book. Yep. And if they are not pro interpreters, person. sorry, it's stage manager, the person who will be actually directing how the, the, um, the positioning for the interpreter will be. And over the years I've found there are some you never have to worry because they will be as sympathetic as they can within a traditional theatre mm -hmm. research theatre. But if it comes to somebody who, even over years, you know they won't have even told the cast. And you're trying to work around how do you end up building the bridges to be the person who talks to the actors who say, you know, we're going to be sharing your space, we respect that breaks in. But I was just saying that's a really crucial part. And I know that at the Kings and the Festival Theatre, there will be some people who are really supportive, but there's always going to be one or two that's not. And I just wondered if you've got any comments on how you well, go forward with that. Thanks for that, because I think, I think you've actually hit one of the nails on the head, which is that because on the day it's the interpreter that's there, it's the, it's the interpreter that has to try and fix all these links in the chain. And, yeah, I mean, I heard stories about theatre companies that would come and um, someone in the theatre would say, OK, so your interpreter show is on Friday. And they'd say, oh, what? And there's been no communication in their own organisation. And, yeah, it's just... And I think... I think the, the, the interpreters are just caught in the middle on the day, always, when they've got a really difficult job to do, based on not often not having been supported enough on the way in. And I, th I think actually it's other people that need to take responsibility for that. But how do you persuade them to do it? I don't know. We're working on it. <laughs> when, when I know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This is a, a semi-question and, and semi-sort of in response to that. I'm just thinking about when you have a visiting theatre company come to do their week, week's worth of show, the theatre contract them to come and do that show? Yep. Can the theatre not write into those contracts for everybody? It's a blanket clause that you may have one of your performances interpreted um, so that you should expect that to happen. Because um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of another context where that's happened um, and contracts have gone out, not theatre. Uh, but it makes having a, an interpreted event uh, a standard thing, not a, a non-standard thing, that, that, that the theatre could actually incorporate that into their contractual paperwork. So in the theatres I've worked at, um, that, exactly that happens. So the theatres say, we have a policy that every show is interpreted. If it's here for longer than a week, it will be interpreted more than once. Um, um, they have um, fixed days that the, that the shows happen on, so it's, it's all, the theatre the theater building knows exactly how they're doing what they do, and they tell the theatre company and they invite them to be part of making that happen. It goes in their contracts, and at the end it goes in the contract of their bill, but they still take it off. So it goes in the contract, but the person who signs the contract has information. Because for them it's not so yeah, all, all that all that is happening, but it's just not it's not valued at all. And a lot of the theatre companies say we we've created this thing and we think it looks perfect, and maybe you want to put something else in it. And I think I think to be fair, um, the model that I looked at is the hardest one. So it's thrown up every possible problem. And, I th and there are other models where people work with interpreters for longer um, and, and integrate them into the show more and all that kind of stuff. So it's the worst model, but it is the most prevalent model and it's the one that the most money is thrown at. So it's important that some way it happens to improve and be useful.
This is David. David's my great ally in this project. <coughs> okay. Thank you. So first of all, what I'd like to do is to uh, thank Michael, yeah, you know, sense. for all the information that he we gives have, us, we you know, are. so, uh, and in terms of making theatres aware of what we one need. Time one time just last month, in fact, um, I was giving some feedback about an interpreted performance that I'd seen, and we were in the pub uh, having a chat about it, and I was very surprised that the interpreter told me... You know that there's, you know, there's the touch tour for all the visually impaired people that goes on in the theatre. You know, deaf people should be able to have the same sort of thing. You know, there will be an interpreter there, you know, one and a half hours before, um, doing the touch tour. So there's no reason we couldn't make that accessible. Um, so last week, um, I went along, met the interpreter, got all the sign names got all the placements sorted out beforehand at the same time as the touch tour so that we could also work out where the best place was for us to sit. Um, because obviously, you know, often uh, there isn't an awareness about matching the seats to where the signing is happening. So with those three improvements, you know, uh, in terms of ensuring a neutral background as well, you know, I'd like to thank that theatre for, you know, accepting, you know, uh, giving six of us uh, six seats to go and see the Adams family. So we'll be meeting the interpreter beforehand, doing that before the show. And if that model, if that pilot is successful, then we're going to have, uh, like the Deaf Touch Tour, we're going to have the Deaf Bridge uh, Tour before uh, each show. Uh, to you know, and, and it's those kind of improvements that we can build upon. The other areas, you know, uh, that we can see improvement in is that theatres often don't know what deaf people actually want to see in the programme, you know, in terms of uh, what's going to be captioned, what's going to be interpreted. And, you know, we've asked before, you know, what's wrong with having super titles like they have at the opera, you know, so that deaf and hard of hearing people can uh, access it that way. And they often weren't very well aware of what was going on and deaf people haven't been insistive on, on uh, super titles of the opera. Also, uh, other visual shows that are suitable for deaf people without interpreting. So it's all about raising the awareness and education so uh, these other five shows that deaf people didn't know about can be suitably advertised and promoted. And so we've been doing our best to improve things and, and now they're working a little bit more with the deaf community and we're working back with them, with the theatre. So there is uh, good news on the horizon. had a chance to ask the questions they want. Um, there's been a lot of uh, feedback on Twitter, most of it very, very positive, uh, people wanting to make a connection. <coughs> um, I looked at the questions and I think I've sort of uh, narrowed it down to there's really two questions that people are asking um, several times. Um, the first is, what about integrated theatre? Um, so deaf and hearing actors and interpreters, um, and names have been thrown out like Ramps on the Moon, um, yeah, Ramps on the Moon as one example. So, what are your thoughts on that? And then there are some supplementary ones as well. So, I have two thoughts about things like Ramps on the Moon. On the positive side, this is, this is a good thing. There are going to be deaf actors on stage. Um, it, sorry, just to explain what Ramps on the Moon is. Ramps on the Moon is this huge project that, in England that got Arts Council England funding and um, every year, it was like seven or eight mainstream publicly funded theatres who put this bid in together and every year one of those theatres is going to host an integrated theatre performance on a really big scale. Um, I think next year's is Tommy the Musical. No, sorry, this year's I think is Tommy the Musical. It's certainly a massive musical. Um, and the whole project is being coordinated by Grey Eye, um, which is a theatre company that's about disability and deaf, putting disabled and deaf people on stage. Um, and it's run by a woman called Janie Seeley. Um, but each year, the, the host theatre is, re is responsible for creating this big integrated show. So on, on one level, 
that's really fantastic because it's putting deaf people on stage. If they're using interpreters, then they're also on stage and they're in the action. And absolutely, that's a really good stepping stone. But if we're going to look right into the future, it's also very flawed. It's maintaining the model that deaf people are disabled because Grey Eye and the whole Ramps on the Moon project is a disability-led project, not a deaf-led project. And for all Jenny Seeley is deaf, she's actually deafened. She grew up until she was eight perfectly hearing. She uses her voice all the time, although she can sign. And her experience of being deaf is not that sort of growing up deaf in a separate world. It's growing up in the hearing world. So her, her approach to the deaf experience is slightly different. And I realize this is only one example, um, but I went to see a Grey Eye production in Manchester not very long ago, which integrated, apparently, two or three deaf actors, but most of the interpreting by deaf actors, most of it happened outside the main performance space. And it was a, it was a Spanish play, it was a hearing language play, mostly performed by hearing speaking actors. A couple of them were disabled, and there were two or three deaf actors who translated that play into sign language. So in terms of creating something that's also from the deaf community, that's not it. Neither is putting on Tommy or Sweeney Todd. It's still hearing-led, hearing-dominated. It's still saying very publicly, hearing theatre's best. Let's get a few deaf people in, because physically they're much more interesting to watch. So, yeah, Ramps on the Moon, I think, is a really good thing on one level, but I think it ultimately it doesn't go far enough. Um, and <coughs> so follow-up questions to those, that sort of vein. What are your thoughts about definitely theatre's productions at the Globe? Uh, and also, is the future not actually interpreted performances at all? Um, shouldn't we be looking at, um, for example, the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, Conservatoire of Scotland students? Oh, that's a lot of cans of worms just opened. <laughs> um, what's the first thing before, before, okay. the, before the globe? Um, but that was it, that was just an added, added um, question. What were your thoughts about okay. theatre? So definitely theatre, for those people who don't know, claims to be the only deaf-led theatre company in the UK certainly is led by somebody born deaf, uh, Paula Garfield. Um, and the work is great. The work is great. Um, Paula takes the approach that um, you shouldn't put the deaf experience on stage because that's just banging on about being deaf over and over and over again. So she approaches um, theatre using plays that she thinks are interesting and just makes the main character deaf. So um, last year they did a one-woman show called Grounded, and Nadja Nadaraja, I can't pronounce that surname, um, who's a very good deaf actor, played that character, and there was an interpreter who was right by her all the time. So it's not the deaf experience on stage, but this is certainly some of the best work that's happening at the moment. I um, should also just mention the deaf and hearing ensemble as well that's run by the four lead artists, two are deaf and two are hearing, and they sit in a room and bring all their own experiences and create something from all of that. That's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. But in the absence of a lot of that, I think definitely is right up there. The stuff at the Globe, sadly, I didn't see either of them. Um, I think some of the same thing applies about doing Shakespeare in sign language, is it a gimmick? Is it really what deaf people want to do? But what I've seen of it on those, those shows on video, they look really fantastic. And I think they didn't pull any punches about saying, we're not doing this for hearing people. So if you're hearing and you don't understand some of it, tough. In the same way that when a company, one of them was part of a season of, of translations of Shakespeare from around the world. So if you came and it was in Spanish, then you went to see something in Spanish. And they very much take the same view, and I really applaud them for that, that they didn't, they didn't do it in sign language, but feel the whole thing had to be interpreted or simultaneously communicated. And the Royal Conservatoire, what about them? Um, just, is the future not interpreted performances at all, should we be looking at the RS, the RCS students? I think it would be 
I think in the immediate future it's going to be hard to get away from interpretive performances because the access agenda is so huge and it's so well funded and there's a lot of pressure from um, strategic bodies like Creative Scotland to do something but without the financial backup that theatres are going to go for providing some kind of access as cheaply as they possibly can. And a lot of the feedback I've had back from the theatre that's linked to, oh, we can't do that, is because we don't have a budget for it. So because of financial constraints, I think the sign language interpretive performance is probably here for quite a long time. But I think if we could work towards completely integrated, that would be fantastic. And whatever your views on the course at the Royal Conservatoire, which is a BA in performance, BSL, and and English for all the students, I think 14 of them. The course works. At the end of that course, there are going to be 14 deaf actors looking for work. That's going to have a really massive and positive impact, I think, on what might happen in the future in theatre in Scotland. Because they're quite um, ballsy. Sorry, not to be academic there for a second. <laughs> and final question. Um, how do we get theatres to begin to truly engage with the deaf audience and to commit to the learning and the cultural shift that's needed? With a follow up question or well, comment that was isn't it up to maybe interpreters and deaf people to train theatre companies and actors about how we work? I think it's about starting a conversation. I think that if all these people don't, don't talk to each other, then it'll never happen. And theatre theater staff that I, that I worked with, they're really clear. We don't have a clue what the deaf community is. We can't use sign language. We don't know, we don't know what's expected of us. We don't know how to access the community. We don't even know how to market to it. So that communication, I don't think it's one individual's responsibility. I think it's everybody has to sit down. And I think it's really telling David's comment that even um, in, the, in the couple of months since my recommendations went to the theater, conversations are happening every week. There's email chat almost every day going on between a small group of us. Um, interpreters are staying behind after shows to get feedback, that never used to happen. So everyone needs to start taking small steps, but also demonstrate that there's some benefit from having that conversation. And of course, sometimes you have to be honest to say, we can't do that yet, we don't have the money, or we don't have enough interpreters on our books, or whatever. But just start talking and be honest. And I think once that happens, then anything's possible. Great, fantastic. Thank you again so much, uh, Michael. You deserve another clap. <laughs> Thank you to everyone online for uh, participating and thank you to all of you for coming um, and to let you know that the next EdSign event is on the 30th of March, um, that's a Thursday night, not a Tuesday, so not our usual night um, and that will be Mike Gulliver who will be talking about, um, oh, I have a title but I've forgotten it now, sorry, I have the poster and I'll give it out just before you go, but he will be talking about the um, deaf church in the 19th century and ideas of deaf space and uh, dissent and empowerment. So thank you very much and hope to see you on the 30th. And also, special thank you to Andy and Marion who took on board the fact that I didn't just want somebody standing interpreting, but that we would be a bit interactive and they've genuinely been involved in planning this in the way that I hope will happen in theatre in the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Marion. <laughs>